Good morning, I'm City and State's John Lentz and I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's State Legislative Forum on Housing in New York. This discussion is hosted by City and State and sponsored by AERP New York. And it centers on several legislative proposals pending in Albany where a state budget is due in a matter of weeks. The state legislature's one house budget proposals are expected in days. Housing is always a hot topic in Albany and it certainly is again this year. Uh, in response to the coronavirus pandemic, New York imposed an eviction moratorium that has recently expired. There's, of course, any other number of ongoing efforts to create and preserve affordable housing, uh, especially in New York City, but other parts of the state as well. Uh, other key issues related to housing include an effort to expand right to counsel for tenants who are facing eviction and a push among many progressives for a so-called good cause eviction bill. There's a lot to cover here today and we only have one hour, so let's get going. I'll briefly introduce our panelists and due to time constraints, we'll do without any extended introductions or presentations. I ask that each panelist try to keep responses to two minutes so that everyone has a chance to answer a few questions. And we have a few panelists running late uh, that should be joining us shortly. Uh, our panelists today are State Senator Brian Kavanaugh, who will be on in a few minutes, Assembly Member Harvey Epstein, Assembly Member Anna Kellis, Assembly Member Nader Sayed, who should also be joining us shortly. Uh, Assembly Member Michael Fitzpatrick. Assembly Member Khalil Anderson, may have just hopped on, should be on momentarily as well. Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal is here and will be joined shortly by Assembly Member Latrice Walker. Welcome everyone. And let's start out with accessory dwelling units or these so-called attached or detached residential dwelling units that provide complete independent living facilities for one more persons. Uh, as you know, there was a budget proposal allowing ADUs that uh, the governor removed from her budget or removed uh, a portion of that uh, proposal. Uh, and there's still legislation in committee uh, sponsored by Senator Pete Harcum and Assemblymember Epstein that would authorize these units statewide. Uh, where do each of you stand on this issue? And do you think it will get done this session? And uh, Assembly Member Epstein, you are the lead sponsor of this in the Assembly. Let's start with you. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you to City and State and ARP for holding this conversation around housing issues. It's a critical point of uh, things that we need to deal with in New York State. As everyone knows, we have a homelessness crisis in our state where we have over 90,000 homeless New Yorkers and we need to have everything on the table and all solutions and it's really important that we're having this conversation and a critical piece of the package for affordable housing are accessory dwelling units you know you know the opportunity to create hundreds of thousands of accessory dwelling units across the state these will be affordable units they will be helping homeowners across the state so you could have a senior who is living alone and that adu could help them stay in their home because they couldn't otherwise afford it ADUs can legalize what we've seen in New York where you know, 11 New Yorkers passed away and died because they were living in illegal units. We could have a pathway to legalization. There's so many things we can do. People could extend to their garages. It is an opportunity where we're underproducing housing. And this is a simple, environmentally friendly, cost efficient, giving back to homeowners path to create affordable housing. And it is true that the governor took most of it out of her budget. She left in a piece in the budget that allowed the city to legalize existing uh, legal units and uh, waive a, a few state laws that would be required possibly to wait to, to allow that to go forward. Yesterday, the mayor expressed his support for keeping that in the budget and to allowing ADUs to go forward to legalization in New York City. While I'm disappointed the governor took up the larger issue, I think there's a real opportunity to deal with at least the legalization of existing uh, ADUs in New York City and to have a path forward to legalize those. I think we do need to deal with ADUs. We do need to support our homeowners. We do need to support so many people in New York State who are struggling. We hear it time and time again from our low-income homeowners that I'm not sure I can make it between the property taxes, fixed income. This is a real pathway for our seniors to be able to get resources and revenue, and also for them to get the help. 
My mother, who still lives on Long Island, 82 years old, when the snowstorm happened a couple of weeks ago, she couldn't get out of our house because she had to wait for a neighbor to be able to, to shovel the snow in front of her house. If she had someone who was living there who could help her, who could assist her, it would be a real help for her to, to deal with the lawn and the garbage and the recycling. And at 82, luckily she's still functioning, but it's getting harder and harder. And ADUs are gonna help our seniors across the state. I really will encourage us to continue to talk about ADUs, but hope in the short term that we can deal with at least the legalization opportunity for New York City, giving New York City the local control that it needs to create a path to legalize those ADUs. In, in the governor's revised proposal, um, could you clarify, would that do what you're saying, uh, allow New York City to do that, or, or is that under negotiation? Well, what she's left in the budget would allow New York City to do it, and would I would waive whatever state limitations around that multiple dwelling law, other state limitations that currently prohibit New York City from legalizing a lot of the ADUs. It would give New York City local control to decide if it wanted to do it. And as I said yesterday, Mayor Adams expressed in his letter to the state that he wants the power to be able to create a pathway to legalize those ADUs. Got it. And again, there's there's not um, universal support for this, um, you know, even among members, um, Democrats and, and Republicans in, in the suburbs, uh, upstate have, have expressed some concerns about this. Um, we we'll actually let's go next to Assembly Member Michael Fitzpatrick of Long Island. Uh, you've called this, quote, a death of the suburbs. And, and quote, this is an attempt by the radical wing of the Democratic Party to create more state control in more aspects of our lives. Uh, let's hear from, more from you on your concerns and, and do you see any room for compromise, a way this could um, be adjusted to, to be more acceptable in your view? Well, I, I think, uh, well, first, thank you, AARP and John and Sinning and State. Uh, this is always a, a very helpful uh, forum to uh, have a, a, a fruitful discussion on these issues and good morning to all my colleagues. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're very concerned about uh, the ADU proposal because of how it is structured. It is a top-down approach. It would be a mandate from the state. Uh, <clears throat> it would uh, uh, overrule local control, which is very important outside of New York City. In fact, I think it's important in New York City as well, but uh, outside of New York City in the suburbs and upstate, uh, local control uh, and zoning is very important, and there are good reasons for that. Uh, accessory dwelling units are not new out in the suburbs. We have many of them. Uh, the problem is they are, uh, many of them, most of them are illegal. Uh, we do provide uh, from what we call mother daughters, mother daughter apartments, uh, upstate, they call them granny flats. Uh, but there are a number of issues involved. You cannot just mandate that every municipality must provide for this without consideration for one zoning, uh, and two infrastructure issues. Uh, for example, John, out in Suffolk County, we live above our potable water supply, our aquifer, and you cannot build on uh, a parcel of land in Suffolk County that's less than half an acre in size. So when you, when you mandate additional density uh, in, in, in areas, uh, you have to consider a number of factors. One, uh, the effect on, on water, on infrastructure, uh, potential traffic. Uh, and we have had many problems in our suburban communities with the illegal apartments. Now, I know, that, you know, Harvey is the sponsor would like to see legalization of existing ADUs. The problem with that is I don't think you're going to see people line up to legalize their ADUs because frankly, illegal apartments are created in order to create, generate cash flow for the owner to pay the high property tax bills uh, we have here. And, uh, you know, who is going to legalize their illegal apartment, uh, whether it's for an 82 year old uh, grandmother or for a 21 year old kid just out of college uh, looking for a place to live? Uh, you know, that owner isn't going to want to see his assessed value increased by legalizing it and therefore pay higher property taxes. They're not going to want to see their garbage fee increased. And frankly, they're not going to want to have to pay income tax on the revenue that's generated by the apartment. Uh, I think it's a pipe dream to think that people are going to line up and say, oh, great, I'm going to legalize my illegal apartment now and everything's going to be great. What are you going to net after, you know, the government takes everything, uh, its, its chunk, uh, out of all of this. So uh, the way to deal with this, I think the governor was was prudent in pulling it out of the budget. Uh, I believe she wants to create a commission where uh, we have input from 
uh, our local governments. Uh, we are doing, I know in the town of Smithtown where I reside, you know, we are, uh, we are looking at uh, transit oriented development. We have three railroad stations in my, in my district and uh, we are uh, looking to create uh, additional uh, three and four story uh, density housing opportunities in our downtown areas, but we are limited due to sewer capacity. And uh, we now have, we have a $3.9 million, uh, uh, $3 million grant that's being held up in the Senate uh, that was uh, uh, secured by former Senator Flanagan, but now being held up uh, that would help us, you know, meet that need. And uh, so we're, we're open to that. Uh, in addition, we have, for example, again, in my district, I have the second largest industrial park in the country outside of Silicon Valley. And the town of Smithtown has created an overlay district to create walkable uh, developments inside, uh, inside the industrial park. Uh, in, and this was a collaboration between the Hophog Industrial Association uh, representing all of the building owners and the uh, businesses in there uh, in the park, as well as the town of Smithtown. And they came up with a, a, a wonderful idea. Uh, is there opposition to it? Yeah, there's some opposition, but uh, there is, I think, a broad agreement that this is the kind of thing that we want to, uh, to do. You know, in the suburbs, uh, you know, years ago, people came out, they wanted single family homes and, you know, everybody enjoys the single family lifestyle out here. But there's also a recognition that times have changed, uh, work patterns have changed, uh, young people are forming families at later ages. Many of them are waiting or not even driving cars anymore. You can Uber everywhere. So creating a walkable development near a railroad station is a very attractive option. We have one in Patchogue. We have one on the, on the uh, drawing board at Ronkonkoma, the Ronkonkoma hub. Uh, uh, Farmingdale, there, there, you know, Mineola, there are some exciting developments that have been put up and more are coming. So, uh, but to totally exclude local governments and say, you know, this is going to be, this is from on high, the state says you have to do this. Well, no, there's going to be substantial pushback. It's not the way to do it. And I might add, I remember during the budget presentation, and this is another interesting issue too, uh, John, <clears throat> is that one of the advocates said that once we legalize these accessory dwelling units, uh, we want them regulated. Uh, that is a red flag, uh, a very serious red flag, because uh, uh, what happens if we go through uh, another pandemic or a uh, good cause eviction is passed and you have a problem tenant and you're unable to evict that person or we end up in another pandemic, as former Governor Cuomo said, we would definitely have, there's another one that's going to come. Uh, what happens when that homeowner can't pay their bills because uh, uh, the tenant is not paying their rent? And I can tell you, I have many, many, I've received many phone calls during this pandemic of uh, homeowners complaining that their tenants are still working, they're still earning an income, but the law says they don't have to pay the rent and they're not, and their credit ratings are going, uh, going down the toilet. So, I mean, yeah, appreciate your comments. Yeah, let me jump in. Uh, we just we're joined by uh, State Senator Brian Kavanaugh. Um, let's go to you. You're the the chair of the Housing Committee in your house. We've heard from Assemblymember Epstein, who's uh, the lead sponsor of the ADU bill. We, we've heard from uh, Assemblymember Fitzpatrick, who's a, who's an opponent. Um, and let's hear from you. Um, what's your take on, I guess, both the governor's path forward here and and the legislation that, that Epstein and, and Senator Harcum have? And, and do you think something will go forward this year? Um, I think, uh, first of all, thank you. You know, thank you for the question. Thank you for everybody on this panel uh, and all everybody viewing at home. Uh, I do think it is critical that we find ways to expand uh, housing production uh, in the counties surrounding New York, both for the benefit of those communities and also the benefit of New York City. Uh, New York, it, we live in a country where we're not producing enough housing across the board, uh, and we have housing crises everywhere, but New York has a particularly pronounced version of that. So nationally, we produce about 34 housing units per thousand people. In New York, that number is about 21, and Long Island and in, in Nassau Suffolk County combined, it's about seven. So we need to find, find ways to increase that. And it is an unfortunate fact that 
uh, land use and zoning restrictions and sometimes uh, building code restrictions are uh, an obstacle. And so we want localities to have a sense of some control and to control the destiny of their communities, but it can't be at the expense of entirely excluding uh, rental housing, multifamily housing, and uh, and certainly uh, other kinds of discrimination that go on. Uh, so I do think that, and we're the only state in America with a tight housing market like New York has that has not had a state level intervention. So I think it is uh, time, you know, Senator Member Epstein and my colleague, uh, Senator Harkham have done good work on the ADU issue so far. I think a lot of people were pleased to see the governor taking it up. I think it's okay that it doesn't, you know, the, the governor taking out of the budget is not, uh, you know, the death knell by any means. Um, I mean, you know, there's some limited aspects of it that are still in her budget documents. But I do think we need to, this is an issue we need to address. And uh, Senator Mayor Fitzpatrick, who I always had the pleasure of debating these issues, I uh, used the ranker on housing, and we used to debate these issues on the floor of the assembly often. Uh, but, um, you know, he's touched on a few of the sensitivities people have, but I do think we need to figure out ADUs. I think we need to figure out how to develop uh, higher density housing near transit. And there also may be other uh, issues around density around, uh, you know, large scale single family lots, which historically have been used to ex exclude people that we should be trying to address. Um, so I don't want to predict whether it happens by June 2nd, which is the current day we're scheduled to adjourn, but it is definitely time for the uh, state to address that. And uh, it's really critical in terms of making sure we're producing enough housing for our communities to thrive, for business to be able to recruit workers, for students, and you know, for people to continue to live in the communities that they know and love. And a quick follow-up either for you, Senator, or for Senator Epstein. My understanding was there is $85 million uh, allocated for this in the state budget. Um, with with the governor's uh, adjustment of that proposal uh, in her budget, do we know where that money will go? Assuming that stays in the budget, I guess Assemblyman Epstein. Yeah, I would, I, there's no reason why we wouldn't keep the 85 million dollars in the budget for ADUs. Are as uh, some member Fitzpatrick said, there are places all over the state that already have ADU ordinances in place. Those eight, you know people could then get economic support to, to do those mother daughters as he suggested. Um, if the city goes forward, uh, if he goes forward with the proposal, which I believe we can, or on the city legalization, the 85 million can help legalize other units. It'll create more opportunities for the affordability. It's also part of a five-year housing plan. So I think there's a lot of logic to the 85 million in the budget. And if I could just respond to some of my Fitzpatrick's point around water and sewer issues, septic, you know, all those issues are taking care of the bill. This bill, if you looked at the language of the bill, really relies on local control and says, hey, if there are health and safety issues, this, the locality should decide. If there are septic issues, the locality should decide. If there's, you know, if they have an issue with the aquifer, the locality should decide. It is, it is a really community-driven approach that says, hey, we need to do this statewide, but every locality is so different that we're going to rely on local control to make really important local decisions. So that's baked within the bill. But again, even just a small piece of the bill, which is legalizing in New York, could use that 85 million. And you know, as some member Fitzpatrick says, by him, there are local ADU ordinances. Those homeowners who now have a legal unit could go I'll get some of this money to help legalize their unit and to get real revenue coming in for those homeowners. So I think there are a lot of reasons to keep the 85 million in the, in the budget. It also allows us to continue this conversation, which I think is a critical conversation about the need for more affordable housing statewide. Great, and I wanna to get to, we have uh, three more lawmakers on right now who have not heard from, I believe all three of these assembly members have signed on to the Epstein bill, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's go do assembly member Khalil Anderson of Southeast Queens, if, if you could weigh in briefly. Yeah, John, thank you. Let me thank uh, AARP um, for hosting this very important forum. You know, housing is an issue that is top of mind for all of the residents who live uh, in the 31st, or a majority of the residents, excuse me, that live in the 31st Assembly District and across the state. People are facing uh, this unique crisis where in addition to having over 110,000 people who are identified as homeless and in the homeless uh, shelter system. We also have folks who are doubling up. Uh, we also have folks who don't have the, the space uh, to, to live in the neighborhoods that they were raised and born in. But also, most importantly, those communities are becoming increasingly, increasingly unaffordable. 
And so this requires us to come up with unique ideas to address this historic housing crisis. And so we're going to have to come up with a number of different ways to make sure that we're, we're balancing the things that every community needs in this city. We want to make sure that we protect small homeowners uh, and communities that uh, had to struggle their way into um, their communities. We also want to make sure that we protect tenants and make sure that we're expanding housing options for tenants. And so we have this uh, piece of legislation uh, authored by uh, Assemblymember Epstein that would create a basis in which accessory dwelling units can exist here in the city of New York. It doesn't say, because I want to make sure that we, we speak on the facts, right? We, we're very clear on the social need for housing. We're very understanding that our aunts, our uncles, our neighbors, our cousins, our brothers and sisters are in dire need of housing. But I think that this discussion should be driven by the facts. What the legislation actually says, Assembly Bill number 4854, is that localities must create rules of the road for ADUs. So everybody can have a car, but there's only certain streets that you can drive down. You have to abide by this rule and that rule and this rule and that rule in order to ensure safety on the road. And so that's what this legislation says. And so what we're saying in this legislation, and I'm a co-sponsor of it, is that we need those rules of the road, that we need to ensure that community has input along the way of this process. Uh, and that's what the spirit of the legislation is. Uh, I, you know, not speaking on behalf of the sponsor, but speaking on behalf of myself, I'm a former community board member, and I'm sure my colleagues here have served on their town boards or community boards, and they understand the local oversight, the zoning power, which is the central power of a community board. And no one wants to circumvent that. We're saying that we're facing a historic crisis right now in this moment, and we're providing an option for folks to be able to house their neighbors. Guess what? The legislation, John, also doesn't put a gun to our constituents' heads and say, you got to house this person. You got to open up your garage. You got to open up your basement. You got to open up your attic and house these folks. If you don't want to be in the program, don't opt in. Don't open your home. Don't open your attic. Don't open your basement. Keep your home the same way it is. This just provides an option for housing in those neighborhoods in that community. And so when I think about a sister, a brother, a cousin, a nephew who needs their own space, I'll open up that garage and make sure that I follow every law going forward. If you look closely at the law, there's also a provision in it that requires folks who are looking to upgrade their units to an accessory dwelling unit to go through the board of standards and appeals. So if anybody understands now, if you want to make any additions or renovations to your home currently in New York City, you have to go through the Board of Standards and Appeals, right? And you have to state your case to them. This is the spirit of the legislation. It says that you still have to go through the Board of Standards and Appeals, which also has a community board component. So that's important to understand that there's a number of different protections in place to ensure that the small homeowner understands that this is optional. The secondly, the spirit of the legislation also says that the localities will help build those guidelines, which has to include community boards, which has to include community input, input which is so important. So I, I've been hearing from constituent groups and organizations in my, in my district, but I want to make sure that people understand the facts of the legislation juxtaposed to the historic housing crisis that we're facing in this moment. And it's really important that as a state legislator that I don't tell you what I'm against, but I tell you what I'm for, and we try to figure out how to meet in the middle about what we're for. And so we want to make sure that we protect the integrity of our neighborhoods, John, and I appreciate you providing this platform this, this morning for us to dispel any myths about this legislation and have a collaborative discussion on how we resolve this. Great, thank you, Assemblymember. Uh, we have two more lawmakers to hear from. Let's go to uh, Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal of Manhattan. Over to you. Okay, well, thank, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to AARP. Thank you to my colleagues. Um, 
you know, a lot of people have weighed in on this, so I don't want to take up all the time so we can get on to a next question. Um, I think that we have to be very creative in this state and in this city because we need hundreds of thousands of units of affordable housing and what we have and what is being built right now are thousands of units of luxury housing that aren't filled and we don't need we have a glut of them we have a dearth of affordable units and we need places for people to live you know it this is not a brand new idea adus have been established in places across the country of course when a good idea is uh, brought forth here or anywhere there needs to be a lot of debate so perhaps it's too soon because everyone hasn't weighed in but this is something we need to take seriously we can't like drag this along for 20 years um and there's good robust discussion happening and that's good for the process but we can't dawdle because adus are a viable um way to house more new yorkers and we have to make sure they're safe we have to make sure localities have input but to dismiss this out of hand and say no is just to bury your head in the sand uh it's a great option uh we'll make up rules and regulations counties and municipalities will then we'll have more places for people to live sure thank you assembly member and let's go to uh, finally assembly member hannah kellis and and uh, you have an interesting perspective, I believe, as someone who's not in New York City. Um, and, and what are your thoughts uh, on the, I guess, the governor's move and, and the, the legislation in question? Yeah. So, and I apologize for the puppies; they may bark while we're while we're here. So, um, maybe, we appreciate the puppies. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. I mean, I am uh, upstate New York. I'm not in New York City, but the sentiment is uh, is very similar uh, in some ways. For example, the fact that it does. Uh, in particular, uh, give opportunities for people on fixed income to add, uh, and I've heard this from, from many of my constituents, the ability to add an accessory dwelling unit that they can either rent to supplement a fixed income or they can move into themselves and rent their full house, um, enabling them to age in place. And that is a huge benefit of accessory dwelling units. Um, I, I wanted to just add, I read an article recently that I really appreciated about accessory dwelling units. Very often the argument is used, this is a main, uh, a main tool of local governments. We should not supersede them. We should not take this away. Um, it, it completely uh, takes them out of the picture. I think you've heard from other legislators that this is not in fact the case. There is, uh, there is still significant um, uh, opportunity opportunity and power within the, the bill as it is written uh, for local governments. Um, and in particular, the septic keeps uh, being brought up, but actually, if there's a concern about septic, that is actually a reason to not allow ADUs in certain areas. And that would be determined by local governments. And the other thing too is, uh, you know, the state should not uh, uh, take away uh, local control. Um, the state negotiates with, with respect to local control all the time. And the thing that I thought was, uh, I found kind of amusing in the article was the fact that there's actually a state law that dictates the height of uh, grass that people can have on their yards. Um, so to say that the state does not engage in uh, that, the, the um, local regulation of land management, I think is, is disingenuous. I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Another thing that I think is also really important is, and I read a comment that I wanted to respond to, is that this is a boon for big developers. And in fact, it's actually the exact opposite. What we have now is a situation where if there's a very finite area of spaces in cities and local municipalities um, where uh, um, affordable housing happens, and oftentimes then it happens by large developers who build the large developments um, that small developers couldn't afford to do, one. Um, and two, it completely leaves out um, the, the everyday people like, um, you know, like all of us to be able to participate in development. This is small scale infill development where any homeowner can add housing to their property if that property fits and it fits into septic. So it does add that value. I also want to note, um, and there was another uh, great article about Minneapolis that uh, did exactly what we're trying to do. And they found in fact that the, the property values increased. Um, so to say that they decrease uh, is just not accurate to the actual data. 
Um, there are also uh, stipulations in this related to um, off-street and on-street parking. So uh, that I think is really important. And uh, another thing I wanna note, there is this sort of fear mongering that if this is allowed, that it would create this massive movement of accessory dwelling units that would take over all of our cities and this would be a horrible thing. And again, the data does not show that that is true. The expectation is it would be about a 1% increase um, per year over the next couple of years um, in municipalities. So this is a small scale um, a way, one of many solutions that we need to create, um, to create diversity of housing and particularly help to maintain a, um, a, a mechanism of affordable housing uh, in municipalities. And I wanna point out just one last thing, which is the environmental component of this. What ends up happening when we restrict in every way possible types of small scale infill development, which is oftentimes using more uh, uh, um, sustainable resources, focusing more on wood structures, for example, because they're much smaller, rather than steel and cement and other materials that are extremely greenhouse gas intensive, um, it also decreases sprawl. It decreases dependency on cars. The younger generations don't have cars at the scale the older generations have. This enables people to live in walkable communities without the need for cars and also supporting the local economies and the local stores. And that's what's found to have happened in municipalities that have allowed for accessory dwelling units. Again, that small scale infill development. So there's tons of things we could talk about, but I do think that this is good for people on a fixed income. It is extremely good for young professionals. Uh, and I think that it would actually quell the loss of people from New York State that we have been seeing that is predominantly people from younger, uh, younger, younger ages and people who are wage earners. And we need to stop the outflow of those people, the out migration of those people um, from our state. And I think this is one of the bills that would create a part of that solution. Great, thank you, Assembly Member. Um, we are actually already halfway through our total amount of time, and we're not we're not quite done with the first question. So I'll try to speed things up on the next few questions. I do want to uh, welcome Assembly Member Latrice Walker. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are we've been talking about uh, accessory dwelling units, and I'd like to give you a chance to weigh in. Um, but I, but I, did, I just note here that um, again, this there seems to be not just partisan lines, but but kind of geographic lines. You know, you, you find in the suburbs, uh, there, there's some concerns about this measure. Um, there, there's kind of this quality of life, you know, people move to the suburbs because they want single family zoned housing and, and they want that space. Um, and then, you know, there's more support for this in New York City. Some people have also, I think, suggested that there's a, a racial aspect. There, there, there's segregation in in places like like Long Island, and, and things like this need to be done. I guess Assemblymember uh, Walker, is, is there a racial component uh, to this this policy question with a specific proposal, or more broadly, and, and any other thoughts you have on uh, on the measure? Well. Um... There are usually racial implications um, when we have conversations about housing um, uh, almost at every turn. And uh, as, as housing was a racial issue of, of, of our time in the 60s, it still exists today. Um, I think the Fair Housing Act um, is coming into question a lot when we have a conversation about these accessory dwellings, um, because there's this idea that uh, there's a certain character characteristic of a of a um, of a person um, who will uh, be living in these particular situations. Um, they're low income, and then what you know sort of comes you know associated with that. Um, many we've seen what happened in, in areas across our city, and we know that it happens in um, places like Long Island and Westchester, um, where you know white flight takes place uh, whenever the complexion and the complexity of communities uh, happen. And so again, we are relitigating this conversation um, uh, so much so, and the conversation became so intense um, that it had to be taken off the, off the table. Um, but again, we will remain committed. We know that there's a housing crisis, um, not here in New York City, but really um, all across our state. Uh, and we need to be building more uh, homes and affordable homes uh, for people 
uh, one of the uh, most egregious, I think, things that happened in our in our state is that um, we saw uh, a lot of folk who were moving uh, to places like down south, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, et cetera. Uh, so much so that we had to lose uh, uh, congressional representation uh, in this year's census. And so I think it's going to be incumbent upon each and every one of us to acknowledge just how important it is uh, to provide a place where people can live in dignity uh, and respect, uh, that all communities should be open, notwithstanding how much money you make, your, your, finance, your, your bank account shouldn't determine your zip code. And so we just want to change uh, those dynamics and make sure that housing uh, is fair uh, and it's accessible for all. Great. Thank you, Senator Member. Uh, and finally, I will go to Krista McManus. She's Associate State Director with AARP New York. And, and I'll note that um, the, these units historically have been called granny flats or, or in-law apartments. Could you speak to uh, why AARP is supportive of this bill? Absolutely. Thanks, John. And thanks to everybody on the panel. I really appreciate this very lively discussion that we're having today. Uh, but I think one of the points that has kind of been absent from this discussion is that this is a long-term care issue. And that's why AARP is supporting this ADU proposal. This is about, for us, keeping families together, allowing older adults to age in the communities that they help to build, easing the burden on family caregivers by keeping family close to each other in close proximity. And we have been working on proposals very similar to this one all across the country. And we've been successful in a number of different states and municipalities and have yet to really see this transform the character of a neighborhood, but for the people who choose to build these units on their home, particularly for caregiving purposes, it has transformed their lives and made it so much easier for them to care for their loved ones. So we're at a point now where in the next 10 years, one in four New Yorkers will be over the age of 60. And I don't say this lightly when I say, if we don't act now, we will find ourselves in a crisis. We need to find innovative ways to allow older adults to remain in their communities, maintain their level as being a fabric of the society. And this is a really simple and effective way to do it. Uh, so I wanna thank many of you on the panel for supporting this. And of course, uh, Assemblyman Epstein, and just ask that everybody approach this issue with an eye towards compromise and consensus because it is so necessary for us to find effective ways like this to continue to allow older adults to age in place. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, and we'll move quickly to our, our next topic. And uh, for the next few questions, again, we're, we're running a little short on time already. I'll probably just have two or three of you respond and, and so we can cover as much ground as possible. I wanna hit on statewide right to counsel. So New York City already has a right to counsel law in the books for tenants facing eviction. There's state legislation introduced now on this as well uh, from Senator May and Assembly Member Joyner. Uh, I believe in New York City, tenants with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level and are facing eviction in housing court are, uh, do get access to an attorney. The state measure, I believe, would simply establish a, an absolute right to counsel. Uh, I believe the governor has come out in support of this concept. I'm not sure the details there. Uh, but Senator Kavanaugh, I, I believe, Bill is in your committee at this point. Uh, what's your take on it? Will it advance? Um, what do you see happening here? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it is, you know, it's, it's, I think, a very important goal to make sure that people who are facing, uh, you know, fundamental challenges to their rights and to their well-being have uh, counsel. And obviously, eviction is one of those circumstances. Um, the, you know, the, even in New York City, where there are very substantial resources and um, you know lots of lawyers frankly uh, lots of lots of uh, well-established legal service organizations um it's not a true universal right in the sense that it does not guarantee that there's actually a lawyer available for you it is a program that is intended to expand access to counsel and it's a very important and positive step uh, so you know we have it, it is important that we have this conversation during the budget process because it's going to cost uh, quite a bit to make sure that people have lawyers um, and I think, you know, that we have $35 million that the governor has proposed to provide uh, legal services for folks who are facing eviction. I think a lot of us in the legislature would like to see quite a bit more uh, dedicated to that. Uh, and some of the issues you, you alluded to here in question about exactly what circumstances you're entitled to counsel and, you know, how we're going to make sure that the lawyers are actually available um, 
are you know challenging ones to work out in a system where uh, you know the unlike in New York City where there's a dedicated housing court, housing cases go through many different cases, many different uh, kinds of courts in different uh, jurisdictions. So it's it's pretty complicated issue, but I think again a lot of us are committed to trying to figure out. Uh, how to get it done and make sure that no one is facing imminent loss of their housing without a lawyer to advise them of their rights. Thank you, Senator. I want to go to Assemblymember Epstein. I believe you signed on as a co-sponsor of the, the specific bill in question. Um, what's your view? Assemblymember Epstein, if you're... Sorry about that. I had a problem unmuting. Um, so as a former legal services lawyer, the right to counsel is a critical issue here. I, I mean, uh, so as Senator Kavanaugh said, we really need to have a comprehensive plan statewide. It's really reduced evictions by tremendous amounts in New York City pre-pandemic. This is something that's critical that's gonna happen statewide. And there are so few protections and there are so few lawyers outside of New York City for tenants. And this would really get resources to landlord, protection for tenants and create a comprehensive plan. So. Uh, we need a we need a statewide right to counsel on housing cases, and it will reduce the eviction numbers, but also ensure the landlords get money that they need to keep their to keep their buildings going. Because this is in some ways in New York City, we see this as a revenue generator for small property owners more than anything else. Good, thank you, Senator. And I, and I checked again this specific bill. Um, I don't believe anyone else on the panel has signed on as a co-sponsor. Uh, is there anyone else in, among these lawmakers, among all of you lawmakers? Um, who does support this? If you could just raise your hand, maybe I'll pick one of you to weigh in. Um, okay, uh, Kellis and Rosenthal and Walker. Um, Listen, Member Walker, let's go to you. So <clears throat> the right to counsel is um, uh, important because as you know, when folk are in housing court, it's a crazy place. It's a little bit of like a little kangaroo court because there's people all over the place in the hallways. And for the most part, landlords are always represented by attorneys and tenants are always not. And then um, they're forced to sign into, into these agreements that they will almost never be able to comply with. You know, folk are already behind on their rent, but they're agreeing to pay two times their rent plus their rent uh, in order to um, try to get back on board, which almost is never the case. And so we just want to ensure um, that folk have the proper representation that they need so that they're able to make informed decisions about something as important as a roof over their head and a head for their families. So many grandmothers in our community, we call them gamas, G-A-M-A. Grandmothers are mothers again. And so, um, and as they are raising their family members and their grandchildren, in some ways, great grandchildren, um, many of our schools are even having, you know, a number of transitional students where grandmothers are in homeless shelters uh, because they just aren't able to uh, make ends meet and have to, as you know, make those hard decisions on, do I pay for food? Do I feed these children? Or do I pay my rent? And so we just want to ensure that people have the adequate representation that they need so that when they are up in court against um, the system and their landlords, um, that they are able to um, prevent evictions, uh, stay in their home, but also have the resources necessary, um, whether from government or otherwise, to help uh, pay the back rent and anything associated with um, longevity and their instability. Great, thank you. Could I, could I weigh in on that? And the reason is because uh, quite a few years ago, um, I went, I graduated college and then I came back to the city to move in with my grandmother. Of course, right away, my landlord dragged us to court. I was new in, in this kind of business and um, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I had some, some lawyer help me, but he didn't know also what he was doing. But my landlord had five well-dressed, suited up um, lawyers. Had right to counsel been around when I was dragged into court, as was my 89 year old grandmother, things would have, would have worked out, maybe not better because I ended up staying and I'm right here right now. However, 
you see all the time in housing court people in despair they have uh they have some volunteer you know uh housing court answers and other volunteer lawyers but the fact is that we need to get people to stay in their homes we can't deal with more homeless people in this city and state and so this 35 million dollars is sort of a down payment i i characterize it as something absolutely necessary in addition, we have to pass good cause eviction because then we wouldn't have as many evictions in court. But having a lawyer when your opponent in court has resources and you don't is essential. A quick thought there, good. you mentioned good cause eviction. Could you, uh, I think most of the audience probably knows what that is, but could you weigh in, uh, uh, explain briefly what that is, uh, Samuel Rosenthal? Sure, good cause eviction means literally that there has to be a good cause to try to evict a tenant. It cannot be, as is the case now, that, for example, you complained that the boiler wasn't working or the elevator was broken at where the landlord can say, oh, you're a troublemaker? I am not going to renew your lease. And that happens in the city in market rate housing where people are afraid to complain and demand their rights because they can be turned out uh, you know, if the landlord wants to, this is true across the state as well. It doesn't mean that a tenant cannot be evicted for legitimate reasons. It just means that it can't be um, on a whim because someone doesn't like the way you look, for example. And so about four or five municipalities have already adopted this. Um, this will give tenants a fighting chance, will have more stable lives because they're not always under the threat of a possible eviction on the notion that perhaps the next tenant can pay more. Uh, it's really, it's also really like the decent thing to do. You shouldn't be afraid uh, that your life will be turned upside down uh, for no good reason, except for the want of money. And if there's a good reason, then a tenant represented by a lawyer in court will be able to fight it, but they could also lose because they didn't pay their rent for a time period or they're making a disturbance, whatever the law is, does not allow. But it really gives everyone on on equal footing. And it's the rights enjoyed by rent stabilized tenants and rent control tenants and other tenants who have some protections. But those who are market rate and those who live in like six six or six tenant um, units, they don't have any rights whatsoever. This will preserve, keep people in their homes in affordable units and uh, we need to get this done. Thank you. I do want to go to uh, Assemblymember Fitzpatrick, uh, but I'll, I'll stay momentarily. Um, you know, uh, given the coronavirus pandemic, the, the moratorium and, and that expiring, there, there is a real problem here. There are many people who are way behind on paying their rent. Um, the, the bill language in the right to counsel legislation says New York is facing an eviction crisis of unfathomable proportions due to the pandemic. According to an analysis of census data, almost half of all renting households in the state were not able to pay rent and are at risk of eviction. Um, Assemblymember Fitzpatrick, if you could talk about, I guess hit on a couple of these things, uh, the, the right to counsel legislation, good cause eviction. Um, there's also some people say we should, should go back to an eviction moratorium for some time. What is your view on those three measures and, and is there any kind of other action or, or course that should be taken here? Uh, it, it's it's a very sad situation, John. We have, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's very easy to paint the uh, owner of an apartment building as the bad guy here. And as all of my colleagues know, there are bad actors on both sides of the equation here. Uh, <clears throat> there are plenty of bad tenants out there, and there are some bad landlords. There's no doubt about that. But the, the reality is when... You know, right to counsel uh, is is fine. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Uh, but what we find is in some situations, it's used as a mechanism to just per keep from paying rent. Uh, you know, there are many sad stories out there and we need to do, I think the state needs to do a better job of getting the help to these people. Uh, as we saw during the pandemic, the money in New York State was very, very slow in getting that help out to people. And the, the, the principal problem was how it was structured, because you, you needed to get 
cooperation from the tenant so that the landlord could receive the rent. And, you know, that was very difficult. I, you know, I received many phone calls out here. We have people who own single family homes and rent them out or own part apartment buildings. Uh, and many of them want to work with tenants. They don't want to throw out their good tenants. Uh, you know, good cause eviction is is a potential problem because when there are bad tenants, it will be very difficult to remove them. And I'd like to know, you know, if we're talking about accessory dwelling units, uh, and here's the thing, you know, colleagues here are saying, well, this is what the law says, and, uh, you know, that's not a real problem. But one thing I've learned in 20 years of serving on the housing committee is that uh, uh, what the governor and legislature propose and pass today, they can always change tomorrow, and frequently they do. Uh, so, you know, will accessory dwelling units be covered under the rent stabilization laws? Uh, that would be a very real problem. Uh, you know, fine, you must spend money on good on uh, uh, help for uh, uh, the indigent and housing court. Uh, I don't think there's inherently a problem with that. However, if it's used as a tool to just keep from paying rent uh, at, at, at the landlord's expense, that's not fair to the landlord either, because quite frankly, these buildings have property tax payments to, to make, uh, water bills to pay, garbage bills to pay. Uh, you know, these are, these are businesses that have expenses uh, that keep your community safe and operating, uh, and operating and, you know, so, you know, what good does, uh, you know, does canceling rent do? Who's going to pay the bill for this? So, you know, it's, it's, you know, look, you want to do what's right for people. You want to help people out whenever they can. I think the government has caused some of its own problems by, you know, just bureaucratic incompetence, uh, moving too slow. Uh, but the, 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 Good cause eviction is is rife with problems because it is it really takes away people's uh, you know right to to own their own property and have control over their own. Let property. me jump in there and some of the, uh, appreciate the comments. Just we're running out of time. I want to hit on two more things. The Senator, Do you mind, Ron, if I just answer that uh, misconception very quickly? Right. Well, I did want to go to Senator Kavanaugh quick as as uh, the housing chair in, in the Senate. Um, if you could respond to any thoughts there, and also. Um, one thing the state has done is, is seek more federal emergency rental assistance funding um, to try to help uh, address this issue. If you could say anything you know about the updates there, as well as any response to... Yeah, thank you. Just maybe this to tie a few things together, and I do also want to hear from Senator Kellis, but the... Um, the you know, we, we've talked about, you know, making sure people have a lawyer when they're facing eviction so that they can use the tools available, the legal tools. And, uh, you know, we've talked about good cause, making sure people aren't being evicted for frivolous reasons. Um, but the fundamental question in a lot of localities is how do you pay the rent when people are unable to afford it? And there are two big moving parts here. One is the emergency rental assistance program. We funded it at $2.85 billion. To Mike Fitzpatrick's point, we put $250 million of state money in where there is not a tenant to apply. We're the only state in America that did that. Uh, and that money, all of that money is now accounted for by applications that have been processed. We need more money. The, federal, the state government has requested $1.6 billion from the federal government, which we should get reallocated uh, if the federal government uh, applies the law properly. We've been shortchanged to a very substantial extent. But paying out those COVID arrears that have built up is really critical. And I agree with uh, Senator Fitzpatrick, it's critical for the landlords, but it's certainly critical for the tenants so they're not facing that uh, over sort of overhang of debt coming out of this crisis. But long-term, we need a stable way to pay people's rent. We need emergency rental programs to work better, like the so-called one-shot deals that we use in New York City. But we also need a stable uh, rental assistance program. The Housing Access Voucher Program, which uh, the Senate has been pushing now for a couple of years, uh, is intended to provide a baseline rent subsidy similar to Section 8. We should put that kind of thing in place and we should expand it rapidly. That is the only way we're going to get to the point where we don't have very large scale evictions happening because people can't pay the rent. And the kind of homeless numbers, we have 92,000 homeless people at any given moment in the state. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the core reasons is that we, we lack adequate resources to, uh, to cover the cost of housing. And then long term, of course, we have a capital program that's intended to expand the supply. But the best thing we can do immediately is subsidize rent when people need it and are otherwise going to be put out of their homes. 
And we'll go to Assemblywoman Collins momentarily to give her the last word, but um, Senator, if you could also just, if possible in one minute, uh, tell us about where we're at on the 421A renewal. Is that, so the, the governor came up with her, you know, slightly tweaked proposal on, on, among progressives, there's a real concern that this is a giveaway to developers, others say it has to happen to, you know, have enough affordable housing be built. Where do you see that going? Uh, 60 seconds go. Yeah, so I, I would say I agree with those who've said the current proposal is not that does not reflect an adequate concern for getting enough affordability in exchange for the expenditure of the city's tax dollars, which that program is, uh, and it also doesn't uh, adequately address uh, labor concerns, and I think it should be more attentive to the critical need for sustainability in anything we're building, especially if we're subsidizing with public dollars. So, you know, I think the governor's proposal isn't where it needs to be in order to be included. There's no good reason to do this in the budget unless uh, there's a consensus by March 31st, because this is entirely a city funded program. It has no state fiscal impact. So I think that uh, negotiations are going to continue. I don't want it's very not a good idea to predict things in Albany because one never knows. But, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a long shot that we get it done in the next four weeks. And I don't think there's a big downside to to putting it off and getting it right before we uh, enact anything. And, you know, it's unclear we'll get to a consensus. Thank you, Senator Anderson, and Assemblyman McKellis. I appreciate your patience. Uh, last word to you before concluding remarks. Yeah, I just wanted to, to um, address a few misconceptions. Good cause is related to um, all renters. This is not exclusive to low-income renters. Um, and, and a few other misconceptions. Um, the, uh, there has been comments that this would take away the ability for landlords to manage their own properties. A few things that, are, that exist. One is this is only for properties that have more than four units. Secondly, um, if a uh, there's a unit, if there's a building that has tw uh, less than 12 and a uh, landlord wants one of the units for a family member, that is also a reason that they can take back one of those units. Um, it also lists that this is specific to inability to pay when the rent has been significantly increased or, or if it's exclusive to um, when the rent has been significantly increased. So um, I did want to note there is a stipulation that allows for an increase um, when a rent or a lease ends of an increase of 3% um, or an increase of 1.5% uh, or 1.5 times the CPI, a uh, consumer price index. It's only when it is at, uh, above that that it gives the opportunity or a mechanism for a tenant to bring the case to court to be evaluated in a court setting to identify whether that significant increase above those levels um, is uh, excessive and unjustified. If it is being used exclusively to get the tenant out of the facility, um, but even in the case where a landlord can show that it was a uh, uh, need, uh, it was, um, uh, renovations that were necessary for the building, that is then justified. So there is an entire series of supports for the landlord, but it is a mechanism to prevent uh, people from frivolously being removed uh, because of these excessive increases um, in rent. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood uh, the details of what good cause really is. Um, and does give a mechanism that will keep people in their homes. So thanks for letting me create that clarification. Sure, great, and we're just about out of time. I do wanna quickly flag uh, next week, there's another uh, collaboration between city and state and ARP New York, an event on utilities and energy policy. Uh, same time, Friday, March 12th, a uh, great lineup there as well. Tune in if you like this discussion. Finally, we do have closing remarks from David McNally, Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy for AARP New York. David, over to you. Thank you, John, and thank you to the city and state and to all the legislators who participated today. Ensuring adequate housing that's affordable, especially in our densely populated urban areas and our suburbs, remains a big challenge. I think we've heard that today over and over again. And yes, AARP was disappointed that the governor walked back a comprehensive proposal to expand and regulate in-law apartments, granny pods, granny flats, mother-daughter uh, uh, units, whatever you want to call them, accessory dwelling units, we were disappointed. Outdated ordinances and local laws make the building of affordable ADUs either impossible or cost prohibitive. 
And because most homeowners lack the knowledge to navigate a very complex array of regulatory and permitting processes, the unfortunate real life result is far fewer safe and legal ADUs than we need. We're glad to see the governor stuck with the portion of her proposal that would better regulate current unsafe basement apartments in New York City. We need that. We can't have a repeat of last fall when 10 New Yorkers drowned in unsafe basements apartments in New York City during Hurricane Ida. It cannot be allowed to happen again. We need to fix this problem. ADUs remain a cost-effective solution to expand communities' affordable housing stock over time, and they give homeowners an extra source of income. AARP will continue to work toward comprehensive expansion of ADUs because for our members and for many, many seniors across New York, the ability to live close to family is hugely important. It helps them get badly needed care from their family caregivers and it helps the caregivers, so many of whom work outside the home to be near their loved ones to provide that care. And as Kristen said earlier, that's really why ARP is in this primarily at the forefront. All the other reasons, of course, are important. But from our perspective, this is a critical point of all the work we do, whether it's on livable communities, making communities more age friendly, addressing and disrupting the disparities in ethnic and, and, and racial communities. It all comes back to housing. And this is so important to how we're trying to build a better New York for everybody. We're also, we also support the right to council law, building on and expanding the very successful New York City program. S6678 by Senator May, same as A7570 by Assembly Member Joyner would protect all tenants, especially tenants of color. They are three times likelier than white tenants to be evicted in New York, according to our ARP issued report as part of our Disrupt Racial and Ethnic Disparity Series. Simply put, landlords are usually much more able to afford a lawyer than tenants. We need to level the playing field and everyone should have help in fighting an unfair eviction. I wanna thank you all again and let's do the best we can in the next three months in the next few weeks before budget is adopted to keep New Yorkers safe at home. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks to all of our panelists. Thanks to everyone in our audience today. This concludes our program.